Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, my name is Gaurav Aroda and welcome to the fifth lecture of Spatial Statistics and Spatial Econometrics. In this lecture, we will move on to uh, uh, the formal components of uh, spatial statistical modeling. I want to begin with, uh, you know, uh, articulating the role of spatial statistics. So statistics, statistics traditionally, traditionally is understood traditionally is understood to be a science, science of uncertainty, uncertainty or disorder. So we view the world, uh, the physical world, the social world, the natural world, uh, whichever you are interested in, as statisticians, uh, econometricians, we view the world as a sequence of random events or random uh, realizations, right? So what we are uh, committing to or declaring when we, when we start to study the real world is that the real world is fundamentally disorderly or there is fundamental uncertainty attached to the events or occurrences that we observe in the world that we are interested to study, right? And statistics is a science that allows us to systematically understand or study, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uncertainty or disorder, right? So, so what statistics does is that it characterizes, characterizes, uh, characterizes or models order in disorder. So it tries to figure out the systemic features, some things that we can explain. Right? So there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of randomness, but some of it, a part of it is explainable, which is orderly. And that order is what we are out here to figure out, to figure, right? So uh, to discover. Spatial statistics, as we have discussed, is an extension, right? Spatial statistics, on the other hand, is a science of uncertainty uncertainty of spatial nature, okay? As we had said, said earlier that spatial statistics will add this, uh, uh, this dimension of location or where to the statistics that we understand on the intensity of events, the count of events, the frequency of events and so on and so forth. So we are not only going to stop at learning what and how, we are also going to start learning the systemic features of where in space are uh, these uncertain events happening. So obviously, uh, through that extension, we can say that spatial statistics will characterize, characterize order and disorder through space, right? Through space means it will explicitly account, explicitly account for space, okay? So this is a fundamental difference between what statistics uh, uh, is understood to be doing uh, traditionally. If some of you are coming from the statistics background, uh, you would have understood uh, the first component. The second component is something that you will learn as a uh, fresh uh, understanding of uh, the spatial nature or exploiting space to figure out systemic features of a disorderly world. Those, those of you who do not come from statistics background, we will, uh, we will provide you a basic understanding of, uh, you know, how traditional uh, statistics 
and spatial statistics will differ uh, uh, technically in a little bit, right? So uh, uh, usually, usually the first step, the first step in spatial analysis is to measure, measure uh, uh, spatial disorder, right? So measuring this spatial disorder would mean that you are, uh, uh, you know, somehow trying to measure variation or the type, the variety of, you know, uh, uh, locational features or spatial features I can describe in the data. So the tools that are available to us are variance, which is quite natural uh, to understand. The second tool is called as the interquartile range. If you have not heard of it, don't worry, we will come back and explain it in a bit. The third is called as entropy. Okay, these are three most popular fundamental, uh, of, uh, you know, metrics of measuring disorder. So I'm trying to find order in disorder as a spatial statistician. Uh, but first, I need to be able to quantify disorder. I mean, I need to be able to understand what's the level of variation in my data to begin with. What am I out to explain? What is the problem I'm, I'm out to address? Right? So that is the aim that I am trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, achieve. Right? So variance and interquartile ranges, these are popularly uh, used or, you know, uh, extensively sort of applied or employed by statisticians, econometricians and so on and so bio, bio statisticians and so on and so forth. Entropy on the other hand is mostly used by engineers and physical scientists. So if you come from physical sciences, uh, you know, uh, uh, background, perhaps you must have heard of entropy. Um, what we are learning here is that entropy does a similar job to what variance does. And this is something uh, we will again uh, see in a little bit uh, going forward. Okay. Um, and entropy provides uh, what is called as the philosophy of technology. So this is something we will spend a little bit of time on because this is interesting. And it also sort of allows us to model certain really important uh, spatial features in the real world, especially regional science or urban science, right? So we will uh, come back to uh, both these uh, categories of measuring disorder, uh, you know, uh, in space. The second step, uh, the second step is, so the first step was to describe measure disorder uh, of the problem that we are uh, interested in. And the second step is to describe or summarize uh, spatial patterns, spatial dependence and uh, I'm, I'm going to say and or spatial autocorrelation in data. So the first step was that I'm trying to understand what's the extent of uncertainty. In the second step, now I'm moving slowly, I've taken one step to figure out some kind of order in this disorder. So I'm, I'm trying to do a pattern recognition exercise. I'm trying to summarize what are the patterns do I see here? Do I see a trend from east to west, from north south, uh, sorry, northwest to northeast, uh, or northwest to southeast, and so on and so forth, right? So, so I am now trying to figure out what are the patterns. Do I see clusters, some kind of networked clusters in some corners or some regions of the data where things might be moving similarly uh, than than other regions, right? So, uh, so here we will study summary statistics for spatial data, right? So of course, you know, whenever we look at any data set, we start to do, we start to look at the summary statistics, you know, that is mean, variance, standard deviation, uh, coefficient of variation, different, different percentiles, you know, the min value, the max value, the value at the 75th percentile, the 25th percentile, the median, and so on and so forth, right? So we will basically articulate 
these tools or these metrics also for uh, spatial uh, data. Then we will look at something really unique to spatial data uh, uh, that are called as the variogram devices. So we will say spatial models for variogram estimation. So the variogram is quite typical to spatial analysis. It is a metric of spatial dependence or spatial order correlation. It is an analog of a correlation device that you are used to in summarizing uh, you know, traditional uh, statistical data sets. Right? So variogram is a measure of spatial dependence and we will be uh, you know, uh, studying this particular tool in detail which will be a discrete sort of you know, extension in terms of your understanding of uh, you know, applied statistics uh, till now. Okay? Uh, third step in this, in this exercise of studying uh, or analyzing spatial data is to explain, explain spatial processes underlying the spatial patterns that were discovered in stage 2 or step. Here we employ principles of econometrics, principles of econometrics and we traverse the journey of correlation, correlation to causation and you know we go from how to what to where to now why. Why do we see what we see in space? Why do we see a west to east gradient in real estate prices in the national capital territory of Delhi? Why do we not see reverse? Why do we not see a gradient from south to north? Why do we not see a gradient from southwest to northeast? Right? Why do we see the gradient the way we see it? Why do we see the patterns the way we see them? Right? So we are trying to answer why this is a fundamental distinction from uh, you know uh, statistics to econometrics and that's why this course is called as spatial statistics and spatial econometrics due to this third component which involves certain advanced uh, you know uh, 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 tools to study uh, spatial data. Right? Now before we move on to uh, talk about the first step which is measuring order and disorder which is the variance, the interquartile range and the entropy. Uh, we will first you know try and understand what is a spatial random variable. How do we articulate randomness in space? Right? So we are going to first study probability distribution functions. Functions and cumulative distribution functions, distribution function in spatial domains or you can say as a function of location. How does the idea of a PDF or a CDF which are very primitive, uh, you know, um, I, I expect that most of you would understand what a PDF or a CDF is. If you don't, that's fine. I mean, you can go back and study these are, these are basic probability and statistics, uh, you know, uh, entities that, that, that you can find in any, uh, you know, uh, 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 basic uh, 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 undergraduate course of, uh, uh, of probability and statistics. Right, so uh, so so let's make a distinction. Let's let's start with making a distinction between traditional statistics. So we will on the left hand side we will articulate what happens in traditional stats, and on the right hand side we will articulate what happens in spatial stats. So in in traditional statistics we are used to 
we are used to starting with a random variable. So say you have a random variable x which is distributed with, the, with probability distribution function f of x, right? And you have a realization of x which we denote as small x, uh, 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 which is a realization, realization of x, random variable x. So when we say, when I say that x has a probability di distribution function, x follows a probability distribution function, what I'm really saying is that x can take a range of values. It can take multiple values with different probabilities, okay, or different frequencies. So how do we understand that? Well, you know, uh, we can plot on the x-axis, we can plot the random variable x. All the different values on x-axis are the possibilities that x can take, uh, you know, uh, 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 on the real number line, which is on the positive side of the real number line as I have drawn it. Although we don't have to, we don't have to uh, respect that restriction all the time, right? On the y-axis, I have what is called as the frequency of observing different values of, you know, possible values of this capital uh, variable x, right? So you can imagine a histogram, right? So histogram gives you a frequency of different values on the x-axis, you know, what will be the frequency of smaller values, smaller, uh, you know, uh, uh, values of this random variable x, what would be the density of uh, very large values of x and then what would be the density of, you know, some values in between. Uh, but whatever we do, you know, we are so, sort of used to looking at a function which looks as nice as a bell curve, which tells me that there is very low density with which or frequency with which I'm going to observe the extreme low values, the extreme high values, and there's going to be quite a high density with which I expect to observe uh, you the, the, the middle values or the intermediate values of x, right? This is not necessarily the only way we can describe a probability distribution function of x, right? We can also define or describe the PDF of x as, as, as highly skewed as on your screens, which basically say, says that there is very high frequency of, of, of low values of x, and as we go on to the higher values, the frequency declines pretty fast and becomes almost near to zero pretty quickly, right? This is a different shape. This is a different description of, you know, uh, of, of the frequency distribution of X. But what is common is that X can take multiple values, a range of values, and to each value is attached a, a probability distribution function, okay? So that's, that's the idea of a random variable. And if we want to understand, uh, you know, uh, what is a realization, so where would this small x would be? Well, it would be, you know, some value on this, uh, on this x-axis uh, that we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we have written down. So this particular realization that would have happened with this level of frequency that I'm marking on the, on the y-axis, f of small x is a realization of x, which we usually get to observe in the real world. So what we get to see is the realization. What we want to understand is the probability distribution. So that's the complex pathway that we, we want to traverse. And hence, you know, we want to sort of, uh, you know, we want to sort of employ certain tools of statistics, okay? Um, what happens in case of spatial statistics? So first of all, because there is this locational understanding, the first thing first that is going to happen is, I'm going to have a location appended to each uh, you know, entity that I am describing in this random uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, universe, right? So X, which is a random variable, it is defined with an index U, which is a location in space. The density f is also described or is also, you know, uh, tied to a given location. 
and then the realization that I am talking about is also tied to a given uh, location, right? Uh, but in case of spatial statistics, instead of random variables, we are usually working with what are called as random functions. So how is a random function different from a random variable? So first up, you can have data for different locations, right? We typically will not have data for just one location. We are going to have data for multiple locations. So let's, let's start there. So we are going to have a random variable x at location u1, which is going to have a PDF f u1 of x. You're going to have random variable x at location u2, which is going to have a PDF u, f u2 of x. And let's say there is a third location where I observe this random variable x uh, with density f u3 x. And I'm going to have, you know, uh, 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 realizations corresponding to these as small x u1, small x u2, and small x u3. So I'm going to now give you a visual representation of uh, random functions. So the first thing that we realize here is that we have three locations, u1, u2, and u3. So let's go ahead and draw these three locations. So I have u1, u2, and u3. Uh, sorry about that. So u1, u2, and u3. At each of these locations, I have a random variable, x of u1, which will have a PDF. So I can draw that PDF now for u1, right? So I have a f of u1 for x, right? So, okay, um, f of u1 x. At location 2, I'm going to have f of u2. And then at location 3, I'm going to have f of u3. Right, so f at u3 rather, right? And I'm out on x-axis on all these graphs, I have the random variable x defined for different locations. Okay, and I have realizations. So first of all, I could have different shapes of density functions at the three locations. Second of all, I might have a realization from different regions of these, uh, you know, uh, 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 density functions. So for example, for the first location, I might draw, my first realization might come from the lower region of x, u1. So I might have a x, small x, u1 uh, on the left side of the distribution. For u2, it might come from somewhere around the expectation or the mean uh, of, of that distribution. So I'm going to have x of u2, uh, you know, uh, 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 delineated like you have in front of your screen. And then x of u3 is going to be, uh, you know, let's say coming from the right uh, uh, region or the, or, the, or the higher side of the probability, uh, you know, of the higher values uh, you know, from some, some higher values of x of u3, right? So the right hand side of the PDF of 3. And, and I have these three, uh, you know, uh, um, locations. So if I have locations, when I do spatial statistics, the first thing I must do it is I must be able to articulate distance. So if I'm working with Euclidean spaces, you know, I'm going to have distances basically uh, defined as the L2 norm as we have studied earlier. So you have three data points which are at given distances, separated by given distances uh, in space. And at each, you know, uh, uh, data point, at, at each, each location, you are going to observe a, look, uh, a realization that is, that belongs to a random variable which can be distributed by a distinct PDF. Now, what differentiates from, uh, you know, random functions from random variables is that usually, usually, um, usually we have uh, the, uh, you know, x u1 
x u2 and x u3 as jointly distributed jointly distributed okay mathematically joint distributions would mean that when i try to explain what value will be observed uh, at location u1 it will give me some information about what type of realization might be observed at u2 and u3 okay so there is a jointness in the way these three values are realized so if you think about the example uh, of groundwater levels right we are we have groundwater you know sitting beneath uh, the surface of the earth we have dug three wells at u1 u2 u3 when i when i look at the value of the depth of groundwater at a location that is connected with the groundwater depth at location at at the, at another location say location 2 why because water is connected beneath the ground there is continuity uh, jointness in the way water levels are going to be uh, evolving uh, beneath the surface in in three points which are in proximity in 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 reasonable proximity over a region right so there is going to be this we are a, we are going to be able to write a joint cdf right we are going to be able to say f which has components as locations u1 u2 and u3 jointly understood uh in a way that when i realize uh, x small x of u1 at location 1 small x of u2 at location 2 and small x of u3 at location 3 i can write this as the probability measure the probability measure that is jointly determined for locations 1 2 and 3 such that uh, that that uh, 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 the probability that capital x u1 is less than small x that is the realization at 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 location 1 the random variable and the random variable at location 2 is less than its realization at location 2 and the random variable at location 3 is less than its realization at location 3 this is a joint cdf that characterizes how the three values will be determined to better understand let's go back to our example of groundwater levels so let's look at an example of groundwater water levels rather an example of joint distribution for groundwater levels data so here you know on ground what i have is three wells so i have three wells where i am able to draw data right monitor data from sorry not draw but monitor what is the depth of data from ground so let's say i have a ground level and i have dug these wells beneath the ground at locations u1 u2 and u3 right and 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 on a given day i have these realizations where i see that groundwater level is at this red dot level at location u1 it is at a the red dot level at location 2 which is slightly higher than location 1 and then it's quite you know uh, 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 below the ground quite a bit below the ground at location 3 the point is that this realization at each individual well is connected with every other realization uh, of of these wells that are representing groundwater which is moving in continuum in you know uh, in space beneath the surface of the earth right so what is happening is that the three observations are connected with each other so when we look at a realization we look at look at them as triplets right so we don't look at them really as individual realizations but they are a triplet realization of the joint density of groundwater levels beneath the ground on another day you can have you know groundwater levels different at different levels at these three uh, locations then your observation will be another triplet which are joined by the green dots or green levels uh, you know uh, levels 
uh, demarcated with the green color uh, at at these locations right so so green is one joint uh, realization of a random function uh, that describes ground water levels uh, uh, in a region in a region with three wells right we could have 300 wells the ex the, the definition will simply extend itself you know uh, uh, naturally right and the reds are an alternative uh, you know i'm just going to say another joint realization of a random function that describes groundwater levels in a region okay now the thing is that usually usually we are given a single a single joint single joint realization in space realization in space and we have to then infer upon the joint distribution right and we need to understand or infer upon understand characterize or infer upon the joint CDF that explains uh, you know um, uh, ground water levels in a region okay so that explains the stochastic nature of ground water levels in a region so once you are able to sort of understand what is the parent uh, CDF you can then you know start to model things uh, much in much more detail Okay, so random functions are really jointly distributed random variables. So there are multiple random variables. Okay, so if we are talking about multivariate, you know, variables, multivariate distribution, something that we a multivariate is a term that was that was also used at the beginning of this lecture, right? So uh, we are talking about multivariate, uh, you know, uh, 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 distribution. So you have more than one variable. These variables are delineated by location. So the multiplicity is derived from location and hence the delineation of space in conducting statistical analysis, right? So the trouble is that I have one realization and I must tell you what is the parent distribution. So I must be able to predict if you were to go ahead and take another, another realization, what should it look like in the sense how it is dependent and what kind of mean values you are going to look at and so on and so forth. This, you know, trajectory from using one realization to providing a characterization of the entire distribution, joint distribution is complicated and it involves, involves this concept, involves the concept of spatial stationarity. This is one of the most important concepts that we will, uh, we, we will uh, study later, okay? We will study this concept later in the course, but spatial st stationarity is the key, key assumption really, okay? It's, it's something that we must go in with. We have to be confident that our, uh, you know, we have spatial stationarity to be able to, you know, uh, uh, expand our understanding of the world from a single realization to what might be happening in terms of joint distribution in space, right? So, uh, so that's that. So, so now, you know, uh, as a next step, what we are going to do is we are going to define uh, variance. So we are going to go back to our step one. Now we have understood random functions. That's what we are going to use to characterize spatial statistics. So we want to first measure disorder. So we had variance, we had 
you know we can say standard deviation although it's a st it's it's just a uh, simple ex uh, extension of variance it's just a square root of variance then you have what we said was interquartile range interquartile range and finally we had what we said what we called entropy right so given a sequence of realizations of a random variable x okay i'm not invoking space now i'm first defining uh, these metrics just i'm just making a quick we are just doing a quick recall so that you can get it and you can we can then uh, you know apply these uh, metrics uh, to spatial data so i have a sequence of realizations of a random variable x let's say x1 x2 and all the way to xn so i have capital n realizations then variance of x is written as summation uh, i equals 1 to n xi minus x bar which is the sample mean uh, whole square divided by n minus 1 the standard deviation of x is square root of variance of x and the interquartile range interquartile range is a little bit interesting and I will talk about why do we care about interquartile range? Why do we even study it? Well, the interquartile range is, uh, is, is, is an interval that lies between the first quartile and the third quartile of data. So what you do is you order your data, order your data in ascending, ascending, uh, uh, sorry about that, just okay. in ascending order, okay. So you organize your data, you organize your data in ascending order of values, right. So organize your data, right. So, you know, let's say, you know, you have a lucky situation, you know, Let's say we have uh, x1 is less than x2 is less than x3 and less than x4 and so on. Uh, so the data are already ordered as presented in the sequence. And, uh, and you know, once you have the data organized in that way, you can go to the 25th percentile, that is 25% of the data, one fourth of data values are smaller than partic that particular value. Let's say, you know, that value is x25. Uh, uh, right and the and the uh, that's called the first that is called as the first quartile the third quartile which is a 75th percentile which basically means 75 percent of my data values are smaller than this particular value let's say the third quartile is x 75 then the interquartile range is is between x 25 and x 75 Formally, IQR can be written as the inverse of CDF at 25th percentile and inverse of CDF at 0.75 percentile with closed bounds. So that's that for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will study uh, entropy, right? We will, we will study entropy. We will see why do we need entropy we have the variance we have the standard deviation we have interquartile range why do we need entropy right so we will we will go over entropy in more formal sense and then finally how does it help us understand spatial uh, data right and now i want to spend a couple of minutes just solving the class exercise that we that, that we opened up in the previous lecture so you know i had given you three situations and i had asked you what kind of spatial data model would be most appropriate in those situations. Let's go right to that and spend a couple of minutes, understand that and, and end this uh, lecture today. So here we are. Uh, this is the exercise from previous uh, lecture towards the end of previous lecture where I had uh, given you a little exercise uh, where you know I wanted you to identify the appropriate spatial data model for following variables. Remember, we have three models. We have the geostatistical model. Uh, sorry about that. 
we have the geo statistical model, geo statistical data, we have the lattice data which are more coarse administrative boundaries remember and finally we have the point patterns data where the points themselves are random variables. So quite clearly the first one is uh, different wells with coordinates in a domain, right? So there are 10 wells, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So I have 10 wells, they are going to be in a domain and I am observing certain groundwater level depth. Now of course groundwater is, is going to be everywhere. I am only able to dig 10 wells and observe values at those wells. So this is a clear case where the domain D, domain D itself is a continuum, right? It's a continuum. So it, this first example is the case of the geostatistical data. The second example quite naturally is districts, data in districts. So I can only do as much as these 10 districts, the shape and form they may come in is not controlled by the analyst that is the statistician. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 districts. So I'm bound by the, the district boundaries, there is some restriction. This is a classical case of a lattice data, okay? One more way to think about it is that, you know, once you identify the most appropriate model, think about whether you can apply an alternative model. Maybe you can, right? Maybe you can, maybe you cannot, right? So uh, in the third case, uh, you have the, uh, you know, you have Again, you have groundwater wells, so you have these, uh, these wells and um, um, you are observing groundwater level depth, but the variable of interest is whether or not you have a dry well. And as we saw, you know, that dry well, occurrence of dry well is really dependent on what is the water level beneath the surface. And water level going below the level of the well itself is a random process, right? So then what I'm looking at is that whether or not I see a dry well or not is itself a random process. Hence, the third example is a point pattern data. Uh, I hope this, this sort of, uh, this characterization helped you better understand uh, what type of data are seen in different settings. Um, and, 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 um, and, and I, know, I hope you are able to apply this knowledge uh, in the future. So that's it for today. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we will meet in the next lecture. Mm -hmm.